Here. Alderman Roy Wesley. Here. Alderman Sismarski. Here. Alderman Woods. Here. Alderman E. Wesley. Here. I declare a quorum. Uh, next, approval of minutes of the meeting of June 27, 2013. Do I have a motion? Make that motion. Second. All in favor? Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, report and recommendation, Community Park Town Center Vision Plan. Uh, Mr. Euler, I, I take it you have a presentation for us. Yes, we do. Thank you. I'm joined here with John Nelson, who's uh, one of my uh, partners in the firm, uh, Euler Consulting, LLC. And uh, just for the new aldermen uh, who maybe haven't heard us present before, uh, we are both uh, architects, and I've spent my career doing park planning for the last 35 years, um, ending up my career doing designing and building Millennium Park in Chicago, which I still have some involvement with. And we were asked to do a vision plan for, um, for Wooddale, uh, looking at options that would create more of a focus on the center of, of Wooddale itself. And we're a little encumbered by, by this system, but we, <laughs> we uh, ha have all these slides that we intended to uh, present to you, but they're uh, in this format, which is a little different than we expected. So um, anyway, we, this vision plan is meant to be a decision-making tool uh, that will help the city make decisions about what should happen uh, to sort of create a core for the downtown of Wooddale. Uh, Wooddale has attractive amenities, including good housing, stock, viable businesses, substantial green spaces, but what it lacks is a sense of identity, a place and a focus on the center of, of the city. Thousands of people travel through Wooddale and either Irving Park Road or the Metro, but they do not consider the city as a destination. With the advent of a western entrance to O'Hare Airport, uh, Wooddale is an, in an excellent position to become a gateway city. Uh, the vision plan will provide ideas and improvements that will give Wooddale its missing identity by proposing expanded and new amenities that will benefit the residents and attract new visitors. So uh, the purpose of the plan is we were asked to we were commissioned to provide ideas to establish a sense of place or pride, clearly denoting the Irving Park Corridor as, as a significant access and, and the surrounding streets as a destination as well as a transit corridor, and to try to make those things uh, a focus for the center of Wooddale. As the city of Wooddale continues to upgrade and to increase improvements in the streetscape, providing community amenities, and giving the citizens a place to enjoy nature, more people and businesses will consider Wooddale as a place to call home and conduct business. We expect these uh, proposals to be a catalyst for economic development. The guiding principles are to attract a new marker at Wooddale's major intersection should be developed to provide an identity for the city. New amenities would be considered that will identify Wooddale as a destination. We want to enhance the city. Uh, several ideas are being explored, including expanding and enhance, an enhanced park space, a public garden, a themed adventure play space, improved outdoor markets and event spaces, and an adaptable indoor-outdoor performance and event venue. Support in order to enhance the ability for residents and visitors to utilize the new amenities, parking for cars and bicycles should be examined, reorganized, and expanded as necessary. Connect in order to provide the visual quality of Wooddale. The existing street system should be examined to improve uh, circulation, medium and curb plantings, and paving improvements should be considered for the major core streets. The introduction, considerations, the vision plan approach and scale. It's intended to be a dynamic living document, a starting point for 
a process of change that will be Wooddale's guideline for its immediate and future development for the core areas. It is a tool to make decisions now and in the future. The creation of the plan acquired input from the mayor, board of trustees, and the city staff. All of the pre previous plans and studies were, that were undertaken offer an important input to the vision plan. The plan acts as an advisory guide to the Planning Commission and City Council to ensure that residential, public, and private properties are protected and coordinated to one another. New commercial development, new improved streetscapes will also increase opportunities for local businesses. This is uh, just a standard uh, outline of information about Wooddale. Most of this you already know, but uh, included in the plan is a geographic analysis. I think one of the uh, important things is that, uh, it, according to the information we have, there are about 35,000 people uh, in Wooddale in the daytime and uh, 13,500 at night. So uh, the idea, the whole of capturing a lot of these sort of transient people for businesses uh, and, uh, and other functions is one of the goals of the plan. And this just shows the relationship on the small map, where is that thing, to O'Hare, which uh, over there. And the outlined area is the actual area that we are studying right in there. And the, then it, the locational information uh, where the boundaries are, the highways, the major routes. Uh, Irving Park, in this case, is the major access through, through the town center. Uh, at, when we actually get into our study area, we're looking at the, the main axes through the place. And uh, Irving has roughly 30,000 vehicles a day running through it. Uh, there are uh, about 12,000 on Wooddale Road, which is shown in the yellow. And then you've got the railroad tracks that uh, are the red line. And the river uh, creek, which is the blue uh, line running through. So those are really the uh, arteries that inform the planning. Uh, it, the Salt Creek is a unique advantage in a way because it's a natural element uh, and the difficult area is the confluence of Wooddale, the railroad tracks, and Irving, which is a tough one to solve, but that's one of the major uh, things that we, we worked on. Uh, early on, uh, we, there is an assessment of the property ownership and the public land. And as you can see, there's a pretty much a line uh, along the creek where there's a large section of land that is owned by one agency or another, either the city, uh, the county, the park district. Uh, some of it is uh, in the hazard mitigation grant area. And uh, then there are other properties that you might potentially acquire. Uh, the, uh, we did hear that the uh, religious facility uh, has bought another lot that's uh, along the railroad tracks and commercial. So uh, that may be able to be obtained and, uh, and unify it a little more into a, a unified piece of property. And then it's the analysis of the floodplain. Um, uh, the uh, Wooddale Itasca Reservoir uh, is to the north. Uh, I don't know if your flooding this year was as bad as in other years, uh, but uh, it's one of the reasons that, uh, whenever possible, we're recommending this area be assigned to recreational use rather than building more residential there. Uh, as time goes on, uh, it, the rest of the property, some additional property might be acquired. Um, and. Again, I think, as Ed said, it's a very desirable location for residents and businesses because of the character 
uh, of the existing town. You're not you're building on a nice basis. It has uh, a lot of green space already, and it has a, a, a fairly vibrant economy. But the charm of a small town, so that you have to build on those things uh, positively. And the, the, the city has uh, got a, kind of a varied population. It's changing right now. Um, there's some incorrect information there, I see. Is there but, one decimal point missing there? Yeah, <laughs> decimal point is missing. But anyway, um, uh, there is a certain amount of diversity in the community and uh, age groups, uh, young and old, and all of them should be served by the plan. Um, I think uh, as typical of a number of suburbs, as the uh, population gets older, sometimes they sell their home and a younger uh, population may move in that has families again. So there's going to be a, a turnover where all of a sudden uh, kids are going to be in a home that was at one time uh, owned by an elder, el elderly couple who decide that they are uh, going to move into a smaller home or somewhere else. It's a, our goal is to try and create attractions and things of interest that are going to uh, be available to all groups, the kids, the teenagers, young adults, middle-aged people, and elderly. Uh, the existing, uh, these are some images, the existing conditions. Uh, the existing planting along Michigan, or along Irving Park, is, is fairly sparsely landscaped. Uh, a city that's called Wooddale, we believe, should have more woods, at least, <laughs> at least on the major arteries. Uh, so there's a noticeable lack of trees along Irving Park. Um, there's a power line on the north side of Irving Park Road, and the pathway is frequently broken with driveway access to, to homes and businesses. In an earlier plan, it was recommended that those power lines be moved underground. If that's still a possibility, we would encourage it. New signage has been adopted and will be implemented when possible. It's also recommended by that new construction along Irving Park and Wooddale conform to be modified to a prairie-style architecture, which is what's happening in some of the structures already. If this is accomplished, it would enhance the cohesiveness and identity of Wooddale's physical environment. Uh, the core of Wooddale is currently uneven and diffuse in character with no connecting themes. Um, the water park serves as a rec recreational center in the core area. Festivals are, are present and, and bring this, brings the community together. All of these activities do take place around and near the main intersection, which makes this the prime location to strengthen and invest in. Many small businesses are also located around the core. Strengthening this area will strengthen the economy of downtown Wooddale and foster an improved business environment. The main intersection, Wooddale and Irving, is heavily trafficked. By updating and strengthening the visible appearance of this intersection, Wooddale could potentially receive more attention and recognition rather than just, rather than just being another stop in the east-west travel. Currently, uh, there is a foundation from which to develop an enhanced experience of the natural and man-made open spaces in the study area. The Salt Creek is part of a natural ecosystem, and various public agencies, uh, as we said before, own a large amount of the property along the, the creek. Enhancing the, po the possibilities along the creek could provide both passive and active recreational possibilities for the citizens of Wooddale and bring visitors to, to the community. The current garden along Wooddale Road will need to be relocated uh, because of the traffic lane expansion, but the gar garden offers a sense of pride in the community and a place for plant lovers, and we believe it should be relocated and expanded. Um, again, there is just the general area of the study, and the direct goal uh, is to accomplish uh, sort of three things. A general streetscape, strengthen the core amenities, and create a nature trail. And uh, this is what 
will be following is a collection of ideas uh, to strengthen the physical attractiveness uh, and uh, amenities of Wooddale. I, we were not saying that all of them can be done at once or maybe all of them can be done at all, but they, they'll need to be prioritized and uh, implemented over a period of time. And again, the, the three elements are uh, the streetscape, public amenities, and a nature trail. And the nature trail uh, we're calling the Wooddale Trail, and it is not only a nature trail, but it's a bike trail. It, it can be a lot of different things, depending on what your constituents uh, want. And I think that that eventually would have to be discussed and uh, with a group, with the, your, the people who are most directly involved. And basically, I think we don't want to just read this, but uh, it is the analysis of data which we've done and the goals and objectives which we talked about in earlier meetings and the plan preparation, which is tonight, the, doing the plan. The next steps which you would proceed on to in the future would be actual design of these elements, uh, development implementation, and assuming how they figure out into the administrative structure of the city, what would be private, what would be public, and what would be uh, jointly uh, dealt with. So the improvements we're suggesting to the main intersection would include uh, planting trees along the curb, adding meeting and planters between lanes, creating character through paved walkways, adding signage, signature lighting. We want to strengthen the core with a prominent visual marker landscape mediums, again, and pedestrian demarcations, indoor and outdoor performance venue. We want to extend the nature trail, bring residents and visitors to the core, walking and biking, new businesses and activities, health benefits for the citizens, and connections to the neighborhoods. Uh, these are the area of the proposed streetscape improvements. You can see we've added a lot of landscaping along these arteries. Improvements to the main intersection of Wooddale should establish character and identity for the community, aid in the beautification process, and emphasize the unity of vehicles and pedestrians. <coughs> the Wooddale streetscape. With the addition of marked crosswalks, a clock tower, and streetscape planting, the intersection, this intersection could enhance the experience of the motors, pedestrian, and bikers. Crosswalks, crosswalk improvements greatly increase the safety of the main intersection. Providing a multi-use design to the pavement will benefit the community aesthetically and emphasize the unity of vehicles and pedestrians through the use of marked pathways, tactile paving, and an intersection core. The addition of the clock tower will represent an official signifier to the arrival of Wooddale. The addition of the Prairie Style characteristics, the tower could house translucent LED backlit panels that could change colors and messages depending on seasonal fest festivals and current events. So this is the existing image um, of that intersection. And this is the proposed change. An inexpensive, inexpensive solution to the center of the major street system of Wooddale is to create colored stamped asphalt patterns to define the intersection and create clear paths for pedestrians. Pavement patterns will not only make it safe for pedestrians, but will calm traffic and help define Wooddale's center. Crosswalks. Um, crosswalks and tactile paving, the intersection could be transformed into a prominent feature of downtown Wooddale, which could provide the community with more recognition. Mark crosswalks are an essential component for aiding pedestrians to move safely and conveniently across the roadways. These upgrades to the intersection will emphasize the crosswalks and intersections as a fundamental component of the pedestrian presence 
well, reserving the rights to vehicles on the roadway. The intersection of Irving, Irving Park Road and Wooddale experiences the highly, highest daily traffic volume. It's a logical place for a major signifier. The recommendation is to build an object of sufficient size that will be noticed and remembered by all those who pass by. It could include the Wooddale new logo, a time temperature indicator, or even more elaborate with messages announcing city events, changing the goal colors to go with city festivals. The action element will be designed with these parameters and budget in mind. We've shown one example of a possible version which includes all of these options. The conceptual example shown is constructed in brick and is designed to be in a, a prairie style, much like a lot of the buildings that are being improved or enhanced along uh, Irving Park can be seen from all directions of the intersection is built to a height which ensure, ensures visibility to all motorists and, and pedestrians who pass through the intersection. The translucent panels can provide an opportunity for backlighting. Care should be taken in the, in the intensity of any signage so as not to appear garish or disturbing at night. LEDs can adjust the ambient light automatically. Messages can be added tower from a computer in City Hall. It could also be a good location uh, for a security camera. The addition of medium planting will improve vehicle and pedestrian safety while improving the beauty of the main causeways leading into the main intersection of Wooddale. Working with IDOT, individual communities can establish their own specific Based on the character of the based on the character of the community, and its goals in establishing an individual character, I worked with IDOT on, on improvements in Chicago, and they can be persuaded. Uh, Lakeshore Drive improvements with the median planting was a challenge with IDOT, but they eventually uh, consented that uh, it would really enhance the, which, which is really a U.S. Highway 41. Medium planters uh, provide safety by separating the lanes of oncoming traffic, reduces traffic speed and road rage, encourages pedestrians to cross streets at the crosswalk instead of cutting through lanes of traffic. Landscape mediums help reduce the urban heat island effect by incorporating trees and other plants. Mediums reduce the amount of water that enter the storm sewers by collecting it and introducing it into the soil. Medium planting aids in the beautification and greening process of the streetscape. Planting, plantings can be changed out seasonally, contribute to community character. Plants to be selected for, for drought and insect and disease resistant and also salt tolerant plants can be also be selected. The view of Irving Park before our suggested planting and now with the curbside planting, landscaping along the curbs, medium planting in addition, protecting pedestrians from the vehicles on the major third fair. Use of stone or concrete planters could be used along Irving Park to provide further safety. This is the most tra trafficked area in Wooddale. Front Street uh, before our suggested improvements And Front Street, this is with su suggested planting uh, along the railroad right of way. We would suggest planting along the entire railroad to sort of give the, a much more uh, green character to the whole stretch of railroad. Railroads really, dealing with the railroad is, is really sort of a difficult problem. Um, the, the core area, uh, what we refer to as the core is the uh, block uh, by Wooddale Road uh, north uh, by, on the north by Center Street, uh, Grove Street, and uh, the railroad tracks on the south, and then um, 
uh, Commercial Street is scheduled to be realigned uh, with the proposed improvements of uh, the intersection of Wooddale and Irving. Um, I don't know when those uh, IDOT will go ahead and make those improvements, but uh, it's nicer if uh, commercial is realigned anyway. So this is our, now this slide is a little hard to read because this is where we're packing in all of the potential uh, amenities. Um, that's where City Hall is now. Uh, this is privately owned land. That little square is privately held now, but we're recommending the, to try, I believe that's owned by the bank, that's the woodland in the back, but we'd like to add that. And there is the aquatic center that exists, and um, the improvements that we're making from there is an expanded public garden, and we'll show specific slides of all these things a pavilion uh, for activities, uh, concerts, meetings, stuff like that, uh, a children's uh, adventure play garden located near the pool because we feel that that would uh, kind of, in, they would work together to bring people uh, in. And our, uh, we have still included the old barn. Now, um, there's some, uh, historic barn and house, which evidently is uh, going to be difficult or impossible to obtain. But uh, I think it's a feature that we're considering that maybe there is a barn-like building that could be constructed as an activity center for certain kinds of things, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, I think the, the first thing we're proposing on the site is uh, a public garden much like the one that is there now, but about uh, three times the size, that would really be a feature uh, with casual walking places, benches for people to sit. It would be a focal point uh, for, uh, for Wooddale and for this whole core area. Uh, it would be on axis uh, with Commercial Street going the other way and then Wooddale uh, Road. And the, it would be planted uh, with uh, uh, perennials, native flowers. Uh, those are all of the list of advantages of uh, doing a naturalistic garden. But uh, it would uh, also serve and a kind of a quiet, peaceful area, uh, unlike the more activated things. Um, there is also the notion of creating a pavilion, uh, what we're calling a pavilion. And this is really a multi-use building. Um, it could house uh, special events, uh, the art fairs, craft fairs, amateur theatrical events, exhibits, uh, clubs could meet there. Um, and uh, in this case, we're showing a uh, two-story facility so that it could uh, perhaps have a dining facility or a banquet room on the second floor. Uh, this is something that can be looked at uh, as to the exact programmatic needs that it could fulfill, uh, but this is just a concept. And we're, that glass wall on the first floor is uh, removable, it raises up, so that it would be an indoor-outdoor space. So at the time when you're having maybe farmer's markets or uh, other events, the building could be open, but it could be used in the winter also by closing those windows and uh, be a year-round facility. And that's just a view of the, uh, the first floor, which would have a little platform on it for concerts and events, uh, the meeting room or dining room on the second floor, and again the glass uh, windows which can uh, be open. And this shows outdoor seating uh, for when it's open if you were to have a concert or a similar event there uh, where that could be used for that. 
Um, also, you have festivals such as Prairie Fest and, and a number of other things. Uh, that shows the pavilion uh, being used in that way where you would have the tents, but also you could uh, have events going on within there. And this shows the general area uh, similar to your fest, uh, Prairie Fest now. You'd have tents and things set up that it would be leading toward the uh, children's area further over to the west and uh, with the garden right there and then an outdoor seating area which would, could be used for music festivals when you're having music and for, activity, for other activities when you're not doing that. Um, I, I forgot to mention uh, earlier that our notion is you would take advantage of the existing parking uh, for these functions and probably only during Prairie Fest or something really big would you need more parking if you could strike an arrangement with the bank which has a huge parking lot uh, that I've never seen filled up but probably on evenings and weekends uh, if, if you would uh, make a, some arrangement with them to use that lot you wouldn't have to add more parking for most activities that would occur in this core area um, between the city hall lot the lot that's already adjacent to the aquatic center and the I'm not loud enough everyone usually says I'm too loud <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, and with that added bank parking I think there would be I think we we have a number in the report I think it's 306 spaces or something like that which would accommodate uh, a, you know, over double that number of people. Actually, we're, we're seeing the pavilion as a similar operation to the Cafe Brower in Lincoln Park. And that was an old prairie school building uh, that was unused for many years. And the Zoo Society. And slide this. And the Zoo Society finally uh, took it over and they used it principally as a banquet facility. And they rent it out, it's a very popular location. They make a lot of money off of that operation. And the way they do it is they control the liquor uh, license for it. So if you have a banquet there, you have to buy your liquor from uh, the zoo, which is sort of a strange thing, but they do make a lot of money from that process. Uh, the next item is this uh, idea of an adventure park or for children, a play area that's really exciting and stimulating, something that would be totally unique uh, and an attraction for uh, not only people from Wooddale, but people from outside the community. The equipment would draw children and their parents to the core. This would be designed with innovative and educational elements that provide both exercise and mental stimulation. A few unique ideas uh, that could be uh, considered are a train that could be interactive learning exhibit which could replicate trains from the 19th century. Treehouse Village provides a safe uh, playing environment for kids uh, between the ages of um, uh, four to, to eight. A uh, pirate ship playhouse that can be an attraction and offers fun, interactive, and educational features. Picnic area offers an eating area for families, allows ad adults and seniors an opportunity to rest. Hot air balloon attraction allows uh, children and adults to climb up and look out across the adventure park and the surrounding community. A, um, a maze would allow children to develop spa spatial or orientation skills and give the park additional greenery. The jungle gym would allow kids uh, to play more independently without direct adult supervision, and a, and a water area with a shallow pool could allow children to spa, splash and play, sort of an um, accessory use of the water park. Some images of what the adventure park could look, and we're suggesting these are just ideas. There, there's a whole 
range of things that can be incorporated into this. There's a firm in Germany that's uh, doing a lot of play equipment, and play environments in the United States now called Richter, which is doing some really creative, innovative things that, and they use all natural materials too. Uh, the uh, one idea for the entrance. Uh, this idea of the community uh, country barn and home. Um, we know the original farmhouse um, in Wooddale Road cannot be relocated to this uh, location, but a barn uh, sort of feature could be included, which could, uh, this structure could serve as an educational entertainment area adjacent to the Adventure Park or a standalone facility. It could um, add a component of history to Wooddale and have multiple uses. It could serve as a starting point for hay rides, a sleigh ride, and also act as a focal point for farmers markets, seasonal activities, and a variety of festivals. The existing water facility um, is a fairly successful attraction with uh, most of the clientele from Wooddale could be expanded with some additional water slide features uh, to make it a bigger attraction for, and hopefully attract people beyond Wooddale. The proposed children's adventure play area adjacent to the water park will be a combination of options that will attract users from many of the northwest Chicago suburbs. Uh, there's a possibility to add concession stands along the outskirts of the water park. And now food trucks are a big uh, item in Chicago, and they're uh, becoming very successful, very mobile. And um, I'm sure a lot of those vendors would love to come out to Wooddale and, and park and sell their goods. Um. Moving out of the core area into the final component of the plan is uh, the Wooddale Trail, and uh, that primarily runs along uh, Salt Creek, but um, not completely. Um, there is a, the North Salt Creek Trail, which is the, the green line on the perimeter there, uh, is already in existence uh, by, with the DuPage County District. And the line in red is what we're showing as what we're calling maybe the Wooddale Spur or something. But it could really bring a lot of uh, additional bike traffic, but also uh, jogging, walking, uh, and uh, other activities. As we mentioned, we had the, uh, uh, we showed hay rides and sleigh rides. Uh, those features, if they were to be incorporated uh, during, the, during the seasons, they could use the trail through the woods also. Um, these are just some sketches because you don't really have contiguous property totally along the river at this point. So it, in some cases, you along the creek, excuse me. Uh, so you would have to do some circuitous uh, uh, development. In one case, um, we're recommending that you actually bridge across to Itasca, where they have industrial property that's held back from the river, the creek, along that stretch. And you could have a bridge go over, have it come down, and then come back once you reached a public property again. The same, you could do the same so uh, south of uh, Irving because uh, you own more property to the east, and then you own property to the west, or there's available property to the west uh, through multiple ownership. Uh, so, and it would also be an interesting feature. We have the trail going through the Wooddale core area where all these amenities are, because I think that would bring uh, people on bicycles through the center of town. Now, one option, is, the difficult pinch point is with the railroad uh, tracks, and you could either tunnel under them or bridge over them, but that would be terribly expensive. And I think it would be more uh, activating to actually bring them through this, the central core area uh, and the amenities there, and they might stop if, at a concession stand, or they may uh, come on Saturday uh, for 
of a, a farmer's market, or it's another form of activating the space and bringing users into it. And again, we're thinking of this as a multi-use trail, a mixed-use trail. Uh, there are pluses and minuses to that. Uh, in some cases, they want to separate bicycle and foot traffic, but I think that's usually when they're very heavily traveled. And I, th I don't think this would be, you know, like a super highway of bicycles. So I think it would, the idea of creating a mixed-use trail uh, for bicycles, pedestrians, joggers, uh, and combining its function uh, into a nature trail as well, it's because it is going through a large area of the uh, Salt Creek area, which is a unique feature, and I think that would really draw people. A lot of the Salt Creek, the so-called Salt, Salt Creek Trail it doesn't go near the creek, and you would have a, the advantage of actually uh, doing that here. Um, and th this sh just shows some typical bridges of uh, how they, these are pedestrian bridges, which uh, could bridge over once or twice uh, to complete the trail. Obviously, this would have to be done in conjunction with other agencies, the Forest Preserve District, perhaps the Park District, uh, but I think it would be a strong amenity. And uh, cycling is still, I think, a very popular thing for, for both young people and middle-aged and some old people. So it's kind of a hobby that a lot of people take up for reasons of health. And those that didn't, weren't interested in that might walk or jog. Uh, another feature that could be added to uh, encourage more people to use the trail are fitness stations where um, we would have points along the trail where you could stop and uh, you would have little exercise equipment. So for people who were health conscious uh, or exercise conscious, they could actually do a little routine as they went along the trail. So it's again trying to, as with other aspects of the plan, we're putting a lot of different things into it. You maybe won't do them all, but it's trying to examine all the options that you could do. So now we're at the vision plan implementation. And we, in the report that you'll receive, um, you know, we've touched on the highlights of the report, but there are a lot of, there's lots of other information in the report that uh, you're, you can read at your leisure. But um, for the vision plan to be successful, uh, you need the support, first of all, from the government, but also from the local community and the businesses. And we're suggesting that uh, you create an implement, impl implementation framework to proceed with the pre key recommendations to make it a successful plan. Um, the city is advised to organize a committee in charge of all recommendations that follow from the vision plan. We believe that uh, the community now has to sort of embrace it and certainly discuss it, and um, hopefully they will see the value of, of doing this for Wooddale. It's essential to the implement, implementation process. The vision plan will require numerous meetings, community discussions, and we have to undertake the concerns of local businesses, residents, and property owners. The vision plan for Wooddale is an ongoing process and will change over time to meet current needs and future needs. Social and economic factors will greatly influence the direction of the plan. The city should regularly review the needs of the community and the direction of progress regarding the plan. The vision plan to be successful must cooperate with all concerned parties, including neighborhood associations and business owners and funding sources. Zoning provides a framework that is important to implementing a plan policy. In addition to establishing very types of uses allowed in specific properties, it outlines the overall character of the development to be permitted. Uh, recommendations and ideas uh, presented in the Wooddale Vision Plan should be 
be prioritized based on need, impact, and available funding source, sources or opportunities. Creating the iconic marker at the intersection of Wooddale and Irving Park Road should be, we believe, the first priority. Federal funding for park or bike development could be available through the State of Illinois Land and Water Conservation grants or the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement CMAC program. Bonds could be issued for some of the construction to be paid for by rental or vendor fees. Some av advertising could be sold for revenue on the LED screen of the iconic, mar iconic marker. Some of the elements suggested can potentially be underwritten by donors who would benefit from a naming opportunity, much like we do in Lonnie Park. A public campaign is another possibility for raising money for some of the elements proposed in the plan, such as names and paving bricks or benches. Rental fees can be collected from vendors at farmers markets or other festivals, and certainly fees from uh, the concerts at, at the performance venue, and rental fees can be charged for the banquet facility. So there are a number of uh, and extensive uh, ideas for funding opportunities. So in summary, um, the core area of Wooddale along Irving Park and especially the intersection of Wooddale Road should have a, a distinct character with a defining element such as the clock tower they're proposing. <clears throat> and the surrounding streets should become a destination as well as a transit corridor. Enhancement the enhancement proposed should serve to improve the character of the streets, offer more recreation recreational opportunities within the core district and stimulate business activity. This vision plan contains many ideas and options for reinforcement and the enhancement of the city of Wooddale as a place to live, work, and visit. Not all of the ideas presented here may be implemented, but the plan offers a framework from which to select the most viable features and improvements to move the city forward as a destination. So uh, John and I are not open to any questions. Charles, yes. Alderman Winger. Thank you. Uh, the intersections like Wooddale Road and Irving Park, as well as the median. So it, is that to current scale? Can we, are you estimating that we can put medians in there and then do plantings along the side as to our current structured roads? Yeah, I think uh, certainly RV Park is adequate to do that. There's turning lanes right now and, and striped uh, medium areas along RV Park. So um, if you look at some of the medium plantings like Ashland Avenue or Western Avenue in Chicago that uh, haven't really increased the curb to curb uh, mentioned but they were able to get the mediums in, in the center of the city and, and still retain the turning lanes uh, at the intersection so we believe there's sufficient room and uh, in case of uh, Lakeshore Drive which is the you know the prime example um, IDOT was willing to uh, reduce the uh, the uh, dimension between lanes from 12 feet to 11 feet, and it's a 55 mile an hour, 45 mile an hour um, speed limit. So IDOT was certainly willing to cooperate to enhance the quality of the street. Okay, thank uh, you. I just, uh, sadly, I didn't take pictures of it, but just uh, last uh, weekend, I was up in Michigan City, uh, uh, Indiana, and uh, their main street, which I think is called Michigan, but it's R Route 12, uh, they were had half of this process done on an existing street. And it was interesting to see the before and after, uh, because it's a, uh, they don't have as many small businesses along the street as you do, but it's the same width uh, as Irving. And uh, the trees were still were brand new, so they weren't very big, but they had the, uh, the uh, perennial la planting in. And it really made a, a noticeable difference in the street. And I, uh, I didn't have my phone with her. I would have taken some pictures.
pictures of it because it was a good example to show an actual, and it's closer in scale to what you're talking about. And I think I, uh, there's a report, uh, Roselle is, uh, they have a, they're going to talking about doing something on Irving also as it goes through Roselle. I don't know exactly what, but uh, there was a report published on that. Um, I think one of the things to look into would be uh, how, when and if IDOT is planning to move forward with their major improvements, which include new turning lanes uh, off of Wooddale and, and all kinds of things. Because whatever they're going to do, you would want to coordinate with them and have, hopefully, have them cover a lot of the costs. Right. So uh, that would try to pin down the reality of that uh, timetable uh, and then working within that uh, would be a good thing to do. Alderman Sosmarski. How long would it take you to, uh, if Irving Park decided they were going to go ahead and, or the state was going to go ahead and do Irving Park, how long would it take you to come up with the plan and give it to them to implement that median process and the curb process? We have to get uh, highway planners involved. But we, we've worked with them before and... Um, Good rapport? Yes. Okay. And it would, it would take... Um, you know, it really is a question of funding and getting the, the money from the state to do the improvements. Um, but I think in terms of construction documents, it would probably take about uh, six to eight months. Thank you. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Hi. Here's my suggestion or ideas here. We are in the process, and I will tell you that after yesterday, the design of Urban Park, Wooddale, turn lanes, and that is in the design phase as we speak. Uh, according to our understanding that the construction of that will start next year to proceed. If we are really seriously thinking about going forward with this project and doing something with those intersections and putting these, these flower beds in the middle and all that, here's my concern. We make a decision, we go forward, or we don't. The problem is once we start digging up that intersection, I don't want to come back and tear it back up again. And the other thing is keep in mind, we also are considering a uh, quiet zone in that area, in that, ra in that intersection, which is part of the quiet zone area is being designed as a quiet zone on that, in our intersection there and Irving Park Road. So if we are going to move forward with this thing, I suggest we would do it rapidly to move forward with this if this council decides to and send it out to HR Green because we are in the process of the designing phase of that intersection right now. And if we want to add this in and it's already tearing up, I just don't want to tear it up again once it's done, guys. I mean, we do it right now or else we hold back and don't do it at all. Point is, tearing a road up twice in this community on Irving Park Road and Woodell Road, we're going to tear it up twice? I don't think the people in this community will be happier or the people that come through this town that we're going to construct this two years down the line. So if you want to do it, I suggest we give them directions to work with IDOT or HR Green or whoever it is <laughs> to move forward with some of these plans or we put it on the back burner and wait until down the line. But if you're going to do it, do it now. Mr. Forrest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just kind of want to remind uh, the City Council that uh, John and Ed were uh, hired as consultants to come up with these vision plans, provide us kind of with a conceptual framework. Uh, if we wanted them to go forward out of that scope of responsibility, uh, as Alderman Wesley suggesting, obviously that would be a whole separate discussion, a whole separate, uh, you know, contractual uh, items that we would be entering into with them. I think what uh, they've come up with is uh, a really good, there's some really good ideas that they've presented. Uh, and again, this is a result of conversations and discussion with staff, with 
the city council presentations. Um, Matt Elman is here. Matt's the new director of the park district. I think it's important that the city consider bringing the park district on board as a partner in the development of this community park. Obviously, the water park's going to be right in the middle of this, and uh, you know I think it's going to be good to work with them on that. Um, I think it'd be a really good idea to have a booth or a tent at Prairie Fest and take some of these renderings that John and Ed have come up with, blow those up poster size, have them in the booth so we can start getting some input from the community, uh, see what they think about the vision plan. And I agree with Alderman Wesley, since the, we know the intersection project is going to be proceeding the next year, although tonight we don't really need to make any decisions, staff is not coming to you to make any decisions this evening, but I agree with Alderman Wesley, if we I think we do want to try and move forward and work with IDOT on this. We need to get the committee formed right away and decide whether or not Euler Consulting will be somebody that we work with to, to come up with these designs or you know what our alternatives might be, uh, you know, what's available to us. Alderman Wesley? Here's the problem with this. Whatever we decide to do as a council and vote for tonight or down the line, if it doesn't come back to us soon, we know how hard, well, I don't know how hard, but designing the intersection already, dealing with IDOT and the county on that project has been trying to get this guy on this page, get this guy on this page. So what I'm trying to say here is this council needs to make a decision quite quickly on this. Now my question, and maybe someone else could check into it, if we decide to add some of this into this plan, intersection are we able to use some of that grant money that is earmarked for that intersection to offset the cost of this project that we want to do my concern here I do not want to hold up that project on Irving and Woodell Road any longer we have talked about years and years it's been on a back burner we have been back and forth with this thing so my suggestion is we bring this to council uh, next meeting or, or council meeting and decide which direction this council wants to go. Do we want to have IDA or HR Green start looking at some of these projects in this project and start IDA to look and get their approval? Because I'm sure it's going to change the whole picture of the design and all the paperwork that's already been submitted with this project. So. Let's start thinking of this quite seriously a lot quicker because I really don't want to hold that intersection up any longer. We've been here almost 10 years for the intersection. Uh, Alderman Woods. Oh, that's me. Let me just, uh, a few comments. I, I think, uh, and staff can correct me, I, Euler has been in contact with HR Green with the intersection. The uh, center plantings were already being designed into the roadway at that uh, intersection. So some of the things, the design elements that uh, uh, Mr. Euler and Mr. Nelson came up with are already being implemented in, except for we haven't visualized the plantings and the planters on the sidewalks, which could be separated out. Uh, so we don't, while I agree with Alderman Wesley that we have to move forward quickly. You know, it's not a five alarm fire because uh, some of the things are already being built in there and we're going to be adding some other things. Some of the crosswalks that they've talked about, we received a grant. Some of those are going to be done on uh, Wooddale Road already. So some of the things we have been implementing, uh, just so everybody doesn't get, you know, too bent out of shape. Some of the things are in the works and I think that if we move forward, uh, in a normal fashion, uh, we'll be okay. Thank you. Uh, um, Alderman Woods is, is correct. Um, what I was envisioning is just it's just a massive amount of information for, for tonight. Um, you can just go off and off and off on these ideas. Uh, one idea leads to another. A great amount of these ideas are already in our strategic plan. We've already talked about it. It's, it's how to implement these, what is the priority, obviously the intersections, the immediate priority, so we want to make sure we're on the ball with that. Um, we've got a little bit of time. Um, just a suggestion, I know we've got a planning session coming up that first week of August. This will probably be a main focus of that meeting. 
Um, and again, a lot of those ideas that they presented tonight were in the plan, but not obviously as detailed as they showed us tonight. So this is something we can kind of work out, prioritize what parts of the plan are important now. Like Alderman Wesley said, the intersection obviously the most important, but we've had you know nature trails on our plan for some time now, and now the nature trails are incorporated into the rest of our plans. So this would be a, a good opportunity a month from now to, to really hammer down on, on a lot of these ideas talked about tonight because it is a massive amount of, of, of topics. Even though it's one topic, it covers almost our whole plan. Do we have any idea the cost on something like this? not gone to that step yet of calculating costs that was um, it's something we could do um, but we can do ballpark estimates for some of these elements I think part of it is that we would want to know which things are of interest because you know each specific idea uh, would have a cost attached to it and then all the different options of that idea, such as a children's uh, playground. Well, it depends on how many features you want to include in it. Uh, we'd have to know that. Or, or sometimes you start with a number first and say, well, if we allocated $100,000, what would we get versus $400,000 or something? Uh, so it's kind of it's a, at the idea stage still, and we'd have to focus in on the idea to more accurately estimate the cost. I think even with the, the, the tower, um, we did a conceptual design for a tower, uh, but that might go through further designs. Uh, and it, You might absolutely love that one, but you might want to look at some other ways to do it, and they would have a variation in cost. The same thing with that the pavilion. The design that we showed is sort of a prairie style thing using brick. That would have one cost versus a, a, a building built out of other materials, timber or something. Alderman Roy Wesley. Okay, let me. Um go uh, a little further on this. I'd like to go forward, but where is the next step of how far to go with your company? I'd like to see a proposal of where we're headed with if we're going to go further. I guess this question is for John then. What is the next step with this company? And the cost, Mr. Murmis. Well, I, I think, as we had stated before, we need to, um, and as Ed Euler's team had, uh, had stated, we need to prioritize ourselves, decide what's important before we even, you know, get into those details. I think we need to have a major talking section on the plan before we go down that road. That's just my opinion. We would need to to, to fine tune what we want because I think we're far off from any further proposal. That's my opinion. But their their plan is basically for the, what their contract is basically is the plan. But we're obviously not going to be able to do this plan all in one fell swoop. I mean that would be very difficult to do. So we have to pick which components we want and kind of phase them in. What's important? It's going to take a little time. So then work the contract from that point of phasing in what we want. Yeah, I think, again, we have to meet internally first. OK. Alderman Jacob. Uh, I think you guys did a great job. And uh, you know, I'm all for this. Um, I think from what Eugene and had said, um, I think the main thing here would be to at least get a price on the intersection, because the park could always come later. I mean, the intersection is something we kind of have to move on quickly. So it'd be nice to get some kind of cost estimate on just what's happening on Irving Park and Wooddale Road and get some kind of cost estimate for, at the very least, that for now, which you could probably do that relatively quickly versus the park and all this other stuff. 
Um, that's really the only thing we're under the gun to do is with that intersection to not delay anything. Mayor, please. Actually, I was going to uh, agree with the manager. Some of the first things we want to start, probably the beautification process, probably be the probably the cheapest out of the out of the elements in the project. I know I'm sure the pavilion is going to be a lot more expensive than planting trees and planters. And as far as the engineers, I know last year at, uh, we were downtown, and the engineer was there, and we were talking about planters on the medians and he's like well we really can't do that on uh on Irving Park and right near a main road we walk out Michigan Avenue is loaded with planters I go well, well what are you telling planters. me right here he goes well well we well, I guess we can look at it and I think you were with me that time Jean oh yeah, Christine okay but right that project's next year I want to start with the beautification the stuff that we can get our hands on where you start to see something the items with the pavilion right those are going to be discussion items going to, have to prioritize um, and looking at that where the clock tower was I know we're moving the the railroad boxes that are sitting there right now I hope we're already mo moving them to the back of that project right something we should check into just to make sure where they're moving them Alderman Winger I'm good. Thank you. Alderman Jacob, good. you're good. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Once again, uh, Mr. Mermis. Just real quick. So just as a consensus, uh, maybe get some more detailed information on the immediate intersection area just for conversation's sake in the next couple of weeks. Maybe have it ready by the time of the planning session so we can move quickly is yeah I would say if we could that. do like an, an overview of we, we already have plans going in we're looking at the medians and, and kind of overlay what Euler's come up with mm -hmm. and how much of it matches mm -hmm. and what can we expand on quickly from from that I think is okay. a good approach okay we need to get another mic an easy uh, addition to that intersection is is stamp paving and color paving you know just to define the crosswalks and give the intersection more prominence that that's an easy uh, you know addition so right that's kind of what I was when we we worked uh, off of the engineers plans and th they have allowed sufficient space for uh, medians um, it wasn't clear as of the date that we got those plans, and I, I think that was probably six months ago or maybe more, whether they were actually doing the medians or not. They didn't uh, appear on the plans. I mean, but they're creating the space for it. So I don't know if they're, uh, the plans didn't show at that time the, that level of detail. Maybe it's further detailed now and, and we right. could ascertain what's, what you they're proposing so far and make recommendations based on looking at those plans again Alderman Jacob just one quick question I, I know you guys said you have uh, dealt with IDOT before on projects like this have you dealt with uh, uh, Metra as also or because you were talking about putting in the bushes along the Metra tracks I mean dealing with Metra that's that's a whole different animal I'm told uh, the railroads are Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, with no further questions, I'd like to thank you guys again. I think you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next is report and recommendation on foreclosure property maintenance. Who's going to, John, are you going to take that or Jennifer?
Mr. Forrest. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have uh, Inspector Joe Johnson here, so Joe and I are going to kind of tag team our way through this. Excellent. All right, just I'm going to give a little introduction, a uh, little history on our, our property maintenance enforcement through the years. Uh, once upon a time, long, long time ago, uh, our Wooddale property maintenance issues were pretty limited to the occasional tall grass complaint, but it was at that point it was more focused on maintenance of structures, uh, possible overcrowding situations, those types of scenarios, as opposed to uh, the wave of foreclosures that we saw. Once the real estate market collapsed. I don't think anyone anticipated or was prepared for the magnitude of the foreclosures, and that's obviously not only the everyday citizen, but municipalities in general. Foreclosures uh, and dealing with these vacant properties is not a matter that's unique to Wooddale. Uh, all municipalities, you know, Joe can attest to this when we go to the inspectors' meetings and conferences. This is usually a one of the featured topics of uh, conversation and, and what we can do about that. Uh, when the foreclosure crisis first hit a few years ago, uh, it was very difficult. I mean, we might have identified vacant properties that people had moved out of because, I mean, the first thing that kind of gives it away is either there's a bunch of belongings out in the yard in the driveway uh, and or the grass and uh, foliage kind of gets out of hand on the property. And what we were dealing with for the first several years of this foreclosure crisis was from the time a property begins to go into the foreclosure proceedings till the time the bank actually gets title back, sometimes that period was well over a year. And during that time period, the former owners of the home, of course, refused any responsibility for it. And if we could find out the bank that held the mortgage on the property, since they didn't have title to it, I mean, they were not willing to expend the effort and monies to maintain these properties. So the first few years, it was uh, really quite a struggle as we were able to use public work staff to cut the grass, uh, we did that. There was uh, times where we had to hire outside vendors to be able to cut the grass. Occasionally, we'd have to hire a vendor to actually clean up the site. And what our typical remedy was, was, you know, we would put a lien on the property in hopes of recouping the costs at some point in time. The problem that you have with some of these short sales and sheriff sales is uh, once you get the legal system involved, it's, it's kind of the option of the judge or the option of where your lien comes in the chain of title as to whether or not it gets satisfied or not. Real estate taxes are typically the first uh, funding that comes out of any proceeds from a sale, and then typically next would be your mortgage and so forth. Uh, years ago, municipalities putting liens on for cutting grass and maintaining properties was almost like a footnote on the list of who gets paid when. Uh, there has been some legislation, and again, Joe will give you a little background on that, that is causing the banks to, uh, forcing them to be more responsible to care for these properties, not only sooner, then later, uh, but also to be responsive to uh, the efforts that the cities and municipalities have put into maintaining this property and allowing us to recoup our costs a little bit quicker. Vacant structures, I know we, we get uh, questions from elected officials a lot of times is, you know, why isn't this posted unsafe or why isn't this posted unsafe? A vacant structure itself is not automatically classified as an unsafe structure. If uh, it doesn't have any broken windows, if the windows are locked, if the doors are locked, if the place is not really in that bad of a state of disrepair, just because a place would have long grass and tall weeds, it does not necessarily qualify to be posted as an unsafe structure. What we do uh, post the structures when we become aware of them is a posting that says do not occupy prior to contacting the building department. And what that does is that allows us to have staff go in do a pre-occupancy inspection on these vacant buildings, identify what types of issues might need building permits to correct, and get those things taken care of before somebody moves back in. 
we have had foreclosures in the past that do warrant an unsafe structure posting and when that happens then those properties are also posted accordingly um, one thing to to remember in this kind of straddles not only the uh, foreclosed and vacant properties but even some of the properties that are being occupied right now just because someone may not keep their property in the same condition that you know we might keep our property doesn't necessarily mean there's a violation there so we can't really just blanket go through town and uh, you know constantly be uh, be on uh, the residents about the conditions on their property uh, property owners do have certain rights to privacy so it's hard for uh, for staff we can't for example just walk onto a property and go into their backyard and start giving them a laundry list of things to uh, that, that needs to be repaired any kind of violation uh, and again, Joe can give a little more uh, background on this. It has to be open and notorious. You have to be able to see it from a public way, for example, unless you have a specific complaint and uh, you feel that there might be an unsafe or hazardous condition. At that point, we do have right of entry to go into the property. But just in general, we can't just go into a neighborhood and start walking around in the backyards looking for property maintenance violations. Uh, I guess kind of tied to that is uh, we cannot enforce good ideas. We can only enforce things that are backed up by the code and that can be defended in court. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Joe Johnson. He does have a little PowerPoint here, and I know he has some additional comments. Uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> John pretty much summed things up pretty well. What I got here are just three houses or um, three properties that we've had success with and, and to show you how things have come along in the years um, since we've been doing this. 2008 is when things really started dropping out. Um, and since three since 2008, we've had about 465 foreclosed properties. Uh, 465 foreclosed properties since 2008. That's when things started falling out. Um, now these don't mean that they were vacant. Uh, foreclosed property can be people still living in the house uh, make a payment once every three months. It'll go in and out of foreclosure. This can go on forever. And um, to get somebody vacate a property, very difficult for the bank or anybody else. Um, and you guys are familiar with the unincorporated property over here that we've been discussing of late. I mean, that's a prime example, and that's happened several times in town. So uh, to start this thing here, this will show one of our earlier properties. Uh, quick history. Um, went into foreclosure, in and out. Um, my grandmother was sick. Went down south and a uh, grandfather or a uh, grandson moved in. Had trouble maintaining the thing. Uh, had a lot of a lot of problems trying to keep up with it. We had to be on it for property maintenance problems um, for for literally years. This was a, probably about a three-year pro project. Over there constantly, citations, um, just just trying to work with the people. Again, now people are are in situations where the money is sparse, so. So we're having trouble keeping them maintained. Now this is obviously is, is not a problem like that. It just needs to be cleaned up. Um, then we started getting into some unsafe conditions that we found. Uh, they were very cooperative with us, but again, just we're incapable. So as we went through, you see different stages of it. Um, here's where he started to get in control of things a little bit, tried to get things uh, under control with his funds as best he could, and kept working with them, working with them. Um, same property, and then he kind of started falling off again. Things got bad. Uh, citations were written again. And this is again going through. Just to show you the maintenance on the house, there's several more pictures like this. This electric was actually hanging off the side of the wall. We had to we had to bring in. Uh, comment to fix that stuff for them. And we started getting control. They finally were were moved out of the place, and uh, banks started getting control of it. We kept on them. I got a couple good contacts with uh, several different people in several different several different banks. We got it cleaned up pretty good. Then it went into the next phase where it was sold to a young gentleman. And we went from here 
and this was in a matter of months. And the kid did a wonderful job. He bought a couple more properties in town, my understanding, too. And you're seeing this all over. You're seeing um, uh, companies coming in and buying them properties, which uh, Alderman, well, Roy's not here, Alderman Wesley knows about uh, a couple properties that he's familiar with. And beautiful house has been sold. Somebody's living in it now. This is one of my very, very first, and this went for three years. Um, again, nobody, I could get a hold of nobody. The wife uh, was estranged from the husband and um, trying to get something done here. Again, citation, I talk about citation. I still do not even know what these residents look like. I never had any contact whatsoever. This was almost impossible. The neighbors were helping. A uh, young man next door was mowing the lawn. Um, couldn't get anything done here. Finally, I got a hold of a nice lady down in Texas. Once the, the bank finally took it over, went into foreclosure after writing citation after citation, and the guy just kind of bolted on it. But the neighbors were just aghast. Had to get the police involved. I don't know if Chief Vesta remembers. Um, they actually had this trailer towed out for me. And I would say within a three-week span after getting a hold of somebody at the bank, after, after things started easing up, you started to see a change in things. So we went from this down to now we're here. I mean, I, I, I swear to you, I drove past this house two days ago and had to back up and take a look to make sure it was the right house. I, I, I couldn't even recognize the house. Went from that to that. And that to that. So these were my early ones. Now this one just came on, oh, which about five weeks ago. Um, it was just unbelievable. This is the, the posting that John will talk about. This was a dangerous condition. The inside was appalling. Um, we had squatters in there, could not get them out. It was in foreclosure. We went, locked the house up, came back. They're back in it, going in windows. Um, it was horrible. Grass was tall. We ended up having uh, one of our vendors come in. He cleaned as much up as he could just to mow the lawn for the first time. Because what happens with the foreclosures is um, the bank will finally get a hold of it, but it will still take time afterwards. They'll have to go out to their preservation company. Preservation company will have to give bids to clean this up, and it takes weeks and weeks. We didn't have weeks and weeks, so we did bring somebody in to at least move the stuff, get the lawn cut originally. Then I finally got a hold of preservation people. They got a hold of me dealt with uh, another woman from the mortgage company and um, she assured us that within three weeks you wouldn't even know that this house was in foreclosure this is this is how far things have come along and this is what we got now and this is this is about a five-week turnaround but things are moving a lot quicker um, in in some instances and this would be one of them I mean, you wouldn't even tell what was going on there now inside's been cleaned up a little bit of um, work has been done on the outside and the posting's been off, and that's that. Um, so Illinois has seen a 15% drop since last year in foreclosure activity, but Illinois is still the worst, uh, third worst foreclosure state overall. Nationally, we are seven and a half year low in foreclosures, and the rate drop continues at this pace. We'll be at normal levels of foreclosure prior to the, to the. Um, historic crash or crisis that we had. So, so things are definitely working um, in the right direction. What we would do with foreclosures is we would attempt to, re to find a responsible party and enforce maintenance upon them. But as you know, with, if somebody's in foreclosure, they obviously have problems financially, and that was posing difficulty. Uh, difficult. As John would say, we just couldn't get, um, we couldn't get the people to work with us because they just didn't have the money. And it just it wasn't working well. The bank wasn't going to take any responsibility. The people weren't taking responsibility. And um, the influx of time was, it was just a long period because, I mean, the, the people just weren't moving and the banks weren't moving. It, it just was a, it was a bad thing. It was, it was just a bad situation. So um, after years of government involvement, 
the banks have been forced to somewhat be more responsible to maintain the properties as long as they're vacated. They could not do anything until they're vacated. So this too is a lengthy process. And this too is a lengthy process due to preservation companies, as I said earlier. Um, since 2010, we've had 308 foreclosures. The, 300, the 465 were since 2008. But 2010, we have 308. Of the 308, 54 are bank-owned properties. 39 were bought privately, meaning a short sale occurred, a uh, sale prior to the property going into foreclosure. 22 were sold to a third-party purchaser, and 87 were banks sold and have been purchased by private persons since. 44 are in a pre-REO phase or bank-owned phase, meaning the, letter, the lender uh, repossessed the property and has not yet got the quick claim deed. <laughs> That's pretty much where we're at. I mean, um, things are slowing down in the area. Uh, our, our program that we've always used is successful. We are having um, properties cut that need to be cut by a private vendor. I started out the summer with, uh, what were my numbers? Um, 40 to date needed to be cut. Now, these are not a foreclosure, these are all properties, but foreclosures were, were in there. And now, I mean, since, since that early date, I mean, I can't maybe have five. So the people have caught on and then they're getting them cut. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. I don't know if you guys got any questions or. Alderman Roy Wesley. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I don't know if the question came up about the fees. You're the first question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I talked to John a, a little about this, about the fees of what we charge. Uh, what could you go through the procedure of if we uh, hire a contractor? How do how do we retain our money? Do we add extra onto it? From the standpoint of a, a law money lien or something along that line? No. I'm referring, I'm referring to staff time. Who pays for your time to go out there to put that little flag up there to say it needs cutting? Who pays for you to call the, the landscaper up and hire him to cut the grass? Who pays for your gas and your vehicle to go out there and do it? I know it's part of your job. Mm -hmm. um, and the landscaper comes in and says, okay, I'm going to cut this lot for $30. Mm -hmm. Do you take that fee of $30 and say, okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Force, you owe the city $30 now because we cut your grass? Do I, I, I want to know what the, what the process I, is. Mr. Johnson. Um, yes. We'll have the, I'll, I'll notify, I will post a property. Seven days if it's not cut, I'll send it to a vendor, unless I get a call and we make some kind of arrangement. Um, I'll send it to a vendor, he'll cut it, he'll eventually send us an invoice, which we will send to finance, um, and then they're paid, sent upstairs, I believe, and then the property is leaned through the county. That's not my question. My question is dollars. I, I think his question is, do you add any money to cover the cost of you running around to the actual vendor cost of thirty dollars? I do not do that, Mr. Forrest. Maybe you can answer. Yes. That. Uh, at this point, we really um, the way the property maintenance program is set up, and when we hire a vendor like that, it does not. We don't have anything specifically that talks about a uh, additional fee to recoup staff time and so forth. Staff really doesn't have the authority to just arbitrarily set fees for something like that. What we do have is a section in the building code, for example, that says if we have to hire a consultant or we send plans to a consultant, uh, we add a 6% fee onto whatever the costs are. So if you would like us to start you know, adding a, a particular fee, whether it be a set fee or a percentage, uh, you know, that's direction that we would really need to get from the council. But as far as just arbitrarily setting a fee staff really doesn't have the authority to do that and right now we're not doing that we're just trying to recoup the out-of-pocket that uh, the city has expended I call on myself first what I run the committee <laughs> <laughs> um, can't you uh, if if there's a building infraction or something we can find people correct is there not that same capability as a maintenance 
issue or infraction? Isn't there, you know, a minimal $15 fine if they didn't do something or, or perform? Mr. Forrest. That was actually going to be my next uh, part of the presentation here. I just wanted to kind of give you a Reader's Digest version of the enforcement process, how it works, what happens when we write a citation. Uh, so really, once a property is recognized, whether it come in from a complaint from a resident or an elected official, or if we just happen to find something when we're out uh, during our course of inspections, uh, if that property, uh, if the grass and weeds are getting tall, and by the way, the city of Wooddale, uh, our code says that uh, once grass and weeds gets to be 12 inches, at that point, that's when it becomes a violation. So what happens is Joe will post the property. We have these little yard stickers. It's a stake about this tall and a card on there that notifies the owner that, uh, you know, that the property is in violation. They have seven days to cut that grass, bring it into compliance. Uh, and as Joe said, uh, if, if, if he calls and says, well, you know, my lawnmower's broken or I'm out of town or it's too wet, we, we will give them a few extra days. So a lot of times, typically people have 10 days uh, to comply. If they don't comply by that time, one option is for us to issue a citation. Typically when we issue a citation, that can be a dollar amount, anything from $25 up to $750. Or we can, uh, conversely, we can issue a must appear in court citation. When we uh, issue a citation, it, it's something that we kind of make a judgment call at the time. If you issue somebody a citation that has a dollar amount fine on it, and they choose not to pay that, then they would automatically be assigned a court date. If they don't show up to the first court date, then the judge assigns another court date. If they don't show up to the second court date, uh, we can request that uh, you know there be a uh, summons set out, sent out to require them to come. But what you're looking at here is week after week after month after month before we would finally get this person into court. What we found to be more effective is to issue a must appear in court citation as our first citation that goes out because then a court date is automatically scheduled the following month, whatever is the closest uh, court date. Joe does go to court once a month for the different citations that he issues. And what we do is with a must appear in court citation, that allows the judge the latitude to uh, set whatever the fine amount may be. Typically, uh, our prosecuting attorney uh, and the judge, to be quite frank, are more interested in getting compliance rather they are, uh, than they are being punitive and trying to collect money from people. That being said, that typically the minimum fine that somebody would have to pay, aside from the fact that they have to take off of work, show up in court, possibly bring an attorney with them, is the judge, or, or what we've instructed our prosecuting attorney to do, is the minimum fine amount would be court costs, and then enough funds to cover the city attorney's time and then you know something for staff time again that that there is no set figure there that that figure can be fluid uh, sometimes the judges will go along with our recommendations sometimes the judges approach is if by the time it gets to court if the person has brought the situation into compliance they say thanks have a nice day and sometimes they don't assess any fine it's up to the judge to do so uh, hopefully that gives you a little more background on how the enforcement works and uh, the issuance of citations. Again, the bottom line is what we want is compliance. We want people to bring the property into compliance and uh, you know everybody wins at that point. Okay. Alderman Jacob. Uh, what, do, uh, what do the other communities do? I was told that for this meeting you, you guys were gonna make some phone calls and find out what other communities do. The enforcement proceedings in the other communities are, are all very similar, you know, minor variations. But, you know, again, typically you find a violation, you notify the property owner, you give them a certain amount of time to comply. If they don't comply, citations are issued. Uh, what we have found out, uh, City of Wooddale Property Maintenance Code, Municipal Code, allows grass to become 12 inches tall before it's considered in violation. Itasca is eight inches, Bensonville is eight inches, Elk Grove is six inches in a residential, eight inches in commercial. So there is a little bit of latitude and variation there. Uh, I don't know, Joe, you've attended a lot of the inspectors' meetings. Do you find much of a variation as far as procedures, procedurally? No, no procedures are pretty much the same, I think. Um, 
I don't think there's a lot of citations being written for anything along this line or, or anything really. I mean, everybody is just basically out for compliance. Um, I'm finding that a lot of things are mostly complaint based. No one's really driving around too much because of uh, the work with the foreclosures and other things are just not that much time. But if they do see something, they do try and get it rectified, obviously. But that's what, that's what I know when I find out. Alderman Jacob. Uh, well, and you said ours is 12 inches before we even do anything. Um, I, I made a couple phone calls myself to a community, and one of our neighbors, after eight inches, they give a three-day warning. After that, they get a $25 fine. After that, every three days, they get another $25 fine to the city. And if, uh, I'm, I didn't ask when they take them to court or must appear. But again, they start at eight inches in three days. We're at 12 inches and we give them seven days. The, foot's, the lawn's going to be a foot and a half high. Over here, it's eight inches. And in three days, it might be 10 inches high. So we're already ahead of the game. By the time we're doing our foreclosures, the grass is two, three feet high. I mean, why is 12 inches our policy? I mean, has that always been the policy? Who set that policy? It's the ordinance. Mr. Johnson. That's the ordinance. Do you have any more to say, Mr. No, I mean, that's the ordinance we follow. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Let me make one step statement, and then Alderman Roy Wesley. That's can... because you're on the committee. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what is your opinion? My thought initially here is to change the 12 inches to a lesser number. Mm -hmm. At the same same time, I don't want to have you guys driving around for lawn wars because six inch, let's say if I go to six inches, is, which sounds better, you know, but then you might have somebody calling on the neighbor because, you know, I keep mine at four and his six, you know what I mean? So it, it could get out of hand, yeah. but I, but I, but I do think a number less than 12 is something that we could live with. What, what would your recommendation be? Well, Mr. Johnson. Um, I mean, we try to catch it before 12. Um, I don't see, I, I mean, th this, is a, this is a touchy situation. You get a lot of rain, you get people can't mow their lawn. I mean, yeah, on vacation, six, eight inches goes pretty quick. Um, and to be on people for something like that, I mean, I, I just don't see that. People are going to do the right thing. They just got to just gotta have time to do the right thing. Well, You'll it, have the properties that aren't going to do that, and we're on those people. Um, you, know, you got vacant properties that are around, and those things are on a schedule to get cut. And then they, they you know, if they're on a, a two, three-week schedule, and they get higher than 12 inches, I mean, we can hit them. I mean, we can go in there and get them cut and hit them and give them citations, but it's, that's your call. That's your guy's call, not mine. Alderman Roy Wesley, before you come on, Glue. All right. Fire away. Okay. 12 inches is fair enough. The reason is, is bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass, you're cutting at three inches. In a week, I guarantee you, you're at six or seven inches with the rain and stuff. Seniors, some of them are getting cut every two weeks because they can't afford it. So now you're, now you're over a foot. So what do you, and uh, Alderman Jacobs, I understand what you're saying, but landscapers fall behind too on cutting their grass too and you're going to blame the... No, don't raise your hand yet. I'm not done. <laughs> but what I'm saying is we're, we're hitting everyone. I like to hit these, these, these foreclosures or these where you have to go out, and we have to recoup our costs there. If they, if, we got off subject here of my, my, my question because I still didn't get my question answered that I want to sit there and charge these these for your time for what you do for hiring a landscaper i mean you got a landscaper going out there for 30 bucks okay and he's breaking up blades and he's cussing up a storm up there because he's breaking blades and he's not going to want to come back to wooddale so in return he's going to up the price but in return we need to get we need to charge them for your time too yeah. somehow some way 
Mayor, please. Basically, I was told by many people, three inches, you should cut your grass at three inches so the roots get strong, just like Alderman Wesley just said. In a week, I can tell you, I'm in violation every week. By the time I cut my grass, I'm at six inches. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys will be so busy writing tickets. I think part of the problem is Alderman Jacobs said, you know, we're at seven days, but other communities are at three days. This becomes a legal question. How fast can we get them to, I mean, we can cut some time right there, I think, but six, six inches is really, I mean, would you say Elk Grove's at six? Um, Elk Grove at six, Addison at six, Beeville and um, I test at, at eight. eight. I mean, six inches, you guys will be right, you might as well come down the block and you can hit all my neighbors at the same time because we cut them once hit, a week. Hit the city but, too then. But I, th but I think, let's not get out of hand here. I, I think that everybody would understand if it rained for two weeks and nobody cut their grass. That's not the idea is to punish everybody w with their lawn. But we don't have to wait till it's 12 inches by the time the notice gets to them. It's 14 by the time it's seven days. It's, you know, theoretically two foot under nice. Alderman Roy Wesley's guidelines, you know, and then we have to send in not a lawnmower, swather, and then, you know, the hay bales are left on the front lawn to further exacerbate the situation. So what I'm asking for is we look at, obviously we, you recognize the homeowner and, and some of the straits that they might fall in, but the property owners, the right, the left, and front and back also have rights. So there just has to be a fair implementation of the process and maybe taking it down to eight inches in five days or eight inches in four days, knowing that you're not going to drive around and write everybody a ticket for eight inches, right? Just like the, the police chief doesn't write everybody for going 30 and a half miles an hour down Irving Park Road. He waits to 30.75. Can I do a follow-up? Mr. Forrest. I think, I mean, this is almost like a two-part question because we're talking about at what point do we require somebody to cut their grass. You've got properties where there are residents that are living that are not behind on their mortgages. They're totally current on their mortgages. They might be on vacation for two weeks or they might have a broken leg or the lawnmower might be broken. That's one scenario. The other one is the vacant houses that are foreclosures. I mean. In a way, we want to be equitable and fair across the board, but really, I mean, does somebody who's living in the house and home, do we treat them differently than a bank that has a foreclosed property where we have to track down the bank, they've got to get the vendor out, they've got to... Well, I'm going to have to jump in before you finish the story, because I, I understand what you're saying, and a vacant house is a little different than a home with an elderly person and a broken leg. We understand that you went there and that the person has a broken leg or it rained two weeks, but we also understand another property's vacant. What I'm saying to you is we be, have to be proactive in our community to make it look good. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not looking to penalize because I'd be with the, with the mayor. You'd be finding me too occasionally because I can't get my wife to cut the grass every week. <laughs> <laughs> mayor, please. I was going to say, you know, you said eight Alderman Woods, but, you know, what at what about at 10 inches we give them hey you know at at 12 inches we're going to find you you got to get this cut something like that i don't know and i don't know what kind of burden that puts on you guys and i'd really like to know if we can go to this if somebody else is doing three days why do we have to wait seven i know that's a legal question but i don't know let me just get uh alderman jacob i i agree with uh Alderman Woods here, um, you know, the intent is not to pick on the person with the broken leg. The idea is we can't, the number one thing for people coming into the city, no one's going to buy a house in this city. I could drive through Elk Grove Village. I could drive through Bensonville. Those communities have, don't seem to have the issues that we have when I drive through Wooddale. If I was a homeowner, I, if I was looking to buy a house, I'd probably look to buy an Elk Grove before I bought a house here. They don't have the problems we have, so why don't they have these issues? Again, they have a six inch. I'm not sure how quickly they do it, but the town I, I called eight inches and then three days. 
It's like Art said, if it was eight inches or say 10 inches and they have three days or five days and that's it. Um, I called about one of the foreclosures myself and the thing was about three feet long and when we did mow it, there was the Bay of Hala, you know, it was, I mean, it was all dead grass on the lawn. I looked terrible. So in that case, we should have had the landscaper at least rake that up if we're gonna wait three feet. Um, so I'm with Alderman Woods. I mean, we, we have to be a little bit stricter. The vacant house is a little bit more important than the you know person that's away on vacation for two weeks. Thank you. Alderman Roy Wesley. Comment? Yes. <laughs> Alderman Jacobs. I don't know how, where you've uh, been looking and saying that the uh, other towns don't have problems. I have customers in Elk Grove. They have problems. And I've talked to Elk Grove. I've talked to Itasca. I have residents there. I've talked to the villages because I do them on a daily basis to talk to villages. So because of all the rain and stuff. So they do have the same problem, but you don't see it because you're driving through it. I don't know if you're calling them. So we're all in the same boat here. Alderman Eugene Wesley. My question is, why don't we just hire a zoo and get all the goats in town and let them be rented to eat the grass? Because I'll tell you, it seems like we're going back and forth with this, Dean. Let's make them mine up and which direction we go. I'm in favor of doing stronger with the foreclosures than anything, okay? Residential, we should be work, work with them as best as we can, okay? But let's get off this. We talked about this 15 minutes or a half hour. This, why don't we just fence in some goats and rent them to people if we're going to talk about that? <laughs> Mr. Johnson. I, I can say that I get, I don't get even a half a dozen complaints about grass from residents. Yeah. That never happens. I mean, very, very rarely do I get a call from a resident about a complaint. Um, as for single family people living in houses, that rarely happens. You'll get rentals that people aren't cutting, and I'll get on those people. And again, that, I do agree with the three-day thing. That would be a good idea. Ten, three, that, that, that helps a lot. There's no doubt about it. And um, as for writing citations, things along that line, that's counterproductive. That doesn't, that doesn't solve a thing. It never solves a thing. It's just a waste of time. Um, the best thing is to work with people, get the compliance done, and get it done. The vacant lots. A decision's got to be made by what you guys want to do with vacant lots in town, because those things are put on a schedule. If it rains, it's going to go fast. Cause, you know, they're just vacant property. I mean, and everything can't be cut. It's just this isn't a utopia. It's just not going to happen. Um, and like I said, and I get very few complaints about it. But we are on top of this stuff. I mean, I don't. I just don't. I don't. I don't know. Alderman Winger. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to. I have a question, then I'm going to make a motion to put something on the table. Uh, but along the lines of what you just mentioned is where I'm going with this. I'm going to ask you, so the 12 inches, do you find that, oh, if it were 9 inches or 8 inches, life would be so much better? According to what you just said, it, it doesn't sound like it, correct? There's only a handful of when it gets to that point and, and you're in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I'm only one guy. I mean, I will miss property. It's sure. going to happen. People are going to have backyards that we can't see, things like that. That's where I'll get my complaints. Sure. Um, and I do, this on video, I do try to hit places before they're 12 inches. I will stick that thing in the ground and say, you know, like, get this stuff done. Again, I, I mean, I'm only one guy. I got a lot going on, but mm -hmm. um, I, I do try to keep up on that stuff. 10 inches, if I can hit it before 10 inches, I'd like to hit it before 10 inches. But again, I, I can't guarantee I'll do that. And um, the three day thing is a great idea though. That I, that I like, I never liked the seven days. I never really liked the 12 inches either. But um, you know, I think that would benefit us, yeah. Okay, so to, to take it in pieces then, I'm gonna make a motion to, uh, to, to draft, to redraft the ordinance or to amend the ordinance to go from seven days to three days. I would second that. Okay. Mayor, please. Question. Yeah, yeah the, the three days, you know, I, know I, I remember having a conversation with the attorney. Well, you got to give him time. You know, you can't just, you know, and the week, you know, he mentioned the week, but, you know, I think 
one of the towns that he's talking about three days, I think he's the attorney over there as well. So I'm just curious as to the legal for us before, you know. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And that does kind of make sense. I mean, people do need time. I mean, again, I will work with anybody, and, and some sometimes you just have to do that. Someone's going to have some kind of a circumstance, and you just, you know. Right. I, mean, right. I, I don't. I don't think we want to be a town that just is beating on people like that. I mean, no. right. people will do the right thing if they know what to do, and, and generally, we, that's what we try to do: is educate them and, and get them to get it done. And it generally works. I mean, I don't. I know who all the players are. I've been here long enough. I know who to whack and not to whack, for lack of a better term, um, who to watch and who to be on. I the repeat offenders. Stuff. Yeah, I know that stuff. I mean, I just don't see the deal. Alderman Roy Wesley. Okay, Mr. Player, just remember, <laughs> <laughs> when you when the detention pen, we're going to change it to 10. When it gets to 10, you better contact Mr. Gale has to cut that detention pond because it's going to it's going to be up there when it's rainy i don't know how you're going to handle that well i, I know mr gallus has um, been pretty pretty helpful to me with the situation we've i got understand now. that but his the, the they've been up there too yeah but i mean those ponds i mean if you're talking inside of those things i mean how do you get in there? i understand that but because these a lot of these things aren't draining we've got a lot of problems with that stuff i mean that's all i want to know mr chairman Fine, we talked about that. How about charging more for Joe's time? Are we going to put that on future items to talk about? I think that's a discussion for the city attorney and staff to, one, what we can do, what, what the existing ordinances and codes say, what we can do, talking to the city attorney. And then three comes down to what Mr. Johnson touched on, and that's how aggressive do you want to be? Because I can tell you, knowing the code that I know, that he could probably go out and write a citation for everybody on the block if he truly wanted to. So it's I'm what are. I'm talking about when you have to call the landscaper in. That's a different situation. I do know that when they lien the property, if it's a, a $300 lien, I know that it, the, it is a higher price that is put into the county. I do know that. I don't know what the figure is. I don't know how they come to that. But um, the clerk would be able to tell you that. I, mean, I do know that it doesn't go in at 300. It would go in at 450 or something. I, I don't know how they account for that, but but I do know that is that is something that happens. Okay. Mr. Forrest, we'll have to verify the uh, the deputy clerk that really handles the liens and so forth is off on maternity leave right now. Um, Mr. Wilson is off this week, so some information that we'd hope to have available for you tonight, we really can't. But uh, we, we, we will talk to the city attorney. We'll find out what types of fees can be added for staff time legitimately where we would have a good chance of recouping those, and then we can get back to you on that. Uh, as far as a procedural policy and procedural method, what we will do is uh, you know, we'll have Joe, when, when he sees properties where the tall grass is getting around 10 inches, we'll put the posting in right now while we're waiting for if we have to change this from three days to seven days at this point, it's, it's still going to be at seven days, but we'll post the properties uh, when it gets to be about 10 inches as opposed to waiting for it to get 12. So we'll do that short-term enforcement-wise. Uh, Alderman Winger, you, you had a motion. Did, did you want to, we didn't get a second on that yet. Do you want to keep the motion? Yeah, I the, oh, the, the question, second? Chairman. Okay, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 No. 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 Opposed? Opposed. 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 Motion carries? No. Mm -mm. no. Do a roll call. Do a roll call. Do a I'm asking for a roll call. Roll call vote. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Alderman Sismarski? No. Alderman Wood? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? No. Mr. Chairman, yes, and I Mr. will ask that uh, we do not change the ordinance until we get the correct language in that we talked about with the attorney. Because I am not willing. You got to go to council. I, I'm just saying, I, you know, we passed it here at committee. 
I'm just saying, I don't want to spend the money for attorneys if we're going to have another debate on it. Change orders again. Mr. Mermis. Can staff just get some clarity on the motion? Did Was it the, the um, 10 inches and the seven days, the three days? Was it both in the motion? The, no. the height of 12 inches stayed, and only the duration or time frame was shortened. So no change with the inches. Mrs. Ms. Alderman Winger could correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. And, and, and then as we do business normally, that if the attorney, when it's getting drafted, if they say, well, you can't do it, then we won't do whoa, it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Just, you're going to sit here and... You, no. Alderman Roy Wesley. You're not going to sit up here and spend attorney fees without being approved by counsel yet. You can't do that. The attorney drafts the amendment and brings it to counsel. So that, that part is going to happen, that Mr. Johnson is going to have to go to the attorney and say, here's what we're looking to do. I mean, that, that, that's going to happen at some point. Do you want to make a motion okay, to do okay. that then? No, the debate's over. The motion was voted on, it passed. We're going to move forward on that. This item's closed. Items to be configured at future meetings. Uh, Lakota Group, City of Wooddale, Wayfinding and Signage Design Project. Uh, August 22nd, and approval for staff for minor zoning variations, August 27th. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Here. So the minute taker record that everyone's present still. Need approval for minutes of May 9, 2013. So move. Second. Opposed. Uh, I have an important recommendation for mayor's chair, community charity ball. I'm going to defer to Jeff. I did say all in favor. Did. Yeah. All in I favor, aye. All, all in favor. Opposed. No one opposed. Okay. Report and recommendation for mayor's community charity ball. I'm going to defer to uh, city manager Jeff Mermis. Thank you. I'll try to make this uh, brief and not uh, overly uh, complicated. Um, this came up uh, through the course of uh, the budget and through the course of the city receiving uh, correspondence, uh, soliciting donations for various uh, charitable organizations. Um, we do get a number of these um, throughout the year. We, we see more and more um, each passing year. Um, this issue was brought up because one of our, our neighbors um, does a similar program. How it would work is we would facilitate um, discussions with all the charitable organizations in the community, um, get them to uh, you know, sign on to the idea of you know, having a one charitable event. Um, you would obviously need an organization to facilitate the event kind of be the master planner of the event, but the the theory of the um, plan would be each organization would get uh, their representative cut by how many tickets they sell on their end and what items are donated on their end and how much is how much money is uh, collected through those uh, donations or raffles or auctions or or whatnot. So basically, you need a an overall leader within the uh, um, process of the mayor's ball, which could be us, um, and then you obviously need buy-in from all the other um, charitable organizations um, to participate in an event like this. Um, would take, obviously, uh, planning, staff hours to do something like this. If we were to initiate this, um, that's really all I have. Um, I don't have a huge report. It's not a complicated topic. Alderman Roy Wesley. Give me a definition of your, as an organization, Benton High School. If one, one like the band, helps with the event, does that help for dance to get money to then? 
I think in, you know the school district uh, 100 overall would, or school district seven or whatever school district would um, act as one entity. Have each, you know, their their band would go out solicit sales. Um, their palm squad would go out solicit sales. It'd go back into one, you know, district 100 um, pool, and then be divvied up from there. Again, you don't want to make it too overly complicated. I did a little research on this. I talked to Addison, who handles this this fundraiser. I've got one of their books here: Addison Chamber of Commerce, Addison Rec Club, the Trail Theater Boosters, uh, Concord Lutheran School, District Four Educational Foundation for Excellence. They've got uh, Knights of Columbus, I believe, Elmhurst Memorial Hospital. Any organization that's Kiwanis, Nesdra, Parks and Recreation Foundation, Rotary Club, uh, Sister Cities is in here. Well, education for excellent, right. What, not a specific school. Basically, these are more charity-run organizations, like we have the Lions Club, Historical Society, um, and not-for-profits type deal. Basically, this came up when we've had quite a few donations. I mean, people asking for money. This uh, this event for them, approximately, I think, raised about fifty-five thousand for these charities. Now, the ones that put more into it got more out of it. The one thing that did tell me at Addison is the the organizations basically give them. Let's say, Mr. Mur Murmus is the point man. They give them their list. The city mails out the invitations. There's a there's a sheet you can sign off who you want your ticket money to go to. That's how they divvy up the money. So if you sell more tables, you get more back. You bring more raffle prizes for the silent auction. Whatever you bring in, that's what you get. The city basically is just a facilitator. From what I understand, the organizations run the whole thing. Each person has a seat at the table. And the city is really not involved except for sending out the invitation and handling the money for them. That's that's would include some staff time. So that's a decision basically in front of you. Alderman Eugene Wesley. My question to the uh, city managers: Who's going to fund this to get it off the ground? If we choose, if the council choose to do that, uh, you know. Banquet hall. Who's putting down the down payment? Who's going to book the banquet hall and where will we have it? Where is all that money coming from? Is that going to be our share that we got to come up with the money? And how do we cope our money back? And technically, could we take money out of our general fund to fund a program like that? Legally? Why was one in this? Well, typically we allocate a certain amount of funding within the budget through our tourism fund um, for donations like this. So I mean, it doesn't have to be from a general fund. How does that promote tourism? Well, we've historically donated to these organizations through our tourism fund. We've always done that. Alderman Woods. To follow, and, and the mayor can correct me if I'm wrong, is that all the stakeholders are going to be part of the decision-making process and developing what the cost is and determining what the ticket prices are and then selling those tickets. Uh, city manager or, or the mayor can expand or correct me if I'm wrong on that. Mayor. Basically, Edison put some money in, just like we did. I mean, Historical Society, $5,000. Uh, education for Excellence, $500, um, cheering, uh, swim team, whatever. Everybody comes in $500 at a time. Basically the same money we're using right now, only it's for the fu this function, one function. As far as the, the banquet hall, I believe they had over, I want to say, what did they say, 600 people? Well, the only banquet hall big enough, we don't have one. In Wooddale, they would handle it. We'd have to go to Alta Villa. I did 
personally because I wanted to see what, you know, I stopped over there. And he goes, well, yeah, I work, I work out a deal for them. I mean, they do it on, it's not their peak season, works out a deal for them. So, you know, that's basically the alternative unless you wanted to pick another banquet hall. I think there's one in Bensonville and there's another one in Addison, you know, some, you have to start somewhere. And then eventually what happens is the organizations take over. They have one person at the table and if, and to basically they decide, they had organizations from outside, you know, residents that were in Addison, but the organizations were outside the Addison city limits, they were not allowed to participate because it's specifically for Addison. That's what they told me. Now, if you guys want to do something different, of, well, no, no. They they offer to the other the school districts. You, basically, basically our residents, if they go to that Lake Park, I mean, if they want to bring it in, they can. I mean, they're allowed because our residents go to those schools. And actually. Their big thing is Addison Trail, and they have another high school. I forget they told, but the other high school chooses not to participate or whatever. Again, you know, whatever Alderman parameters, Jacob. you know. It's Alderman Jacob. Uh, my question is similar to what Alderman Wesley had asked, Eugene Wesley. Um, and the way I kind of understood it from the way the mayor said it, so we, the city would actually pay say six or seven thousand dollars towards towards it and then all the money the seventy five dollars a ticket that all goes to charity or some of that goes to pay for it mayor please basically uh, i think edison was charging like seventy five dollars for the dinner if i remember right and it included uh, i think they had uh, steak and chicken and open bar and the price was very reasonable, and everybody made so much on the tickets. Then there's other things, you know, Addison's very advanced. They have a, for the silent auction, they have like a little tablet, like a size of an iPhone, where you can, it's like a PayPal or something, and you can bid. So we can be sitting next to each other, and we're both bidding on that memorabilia. You wouldn't even know that I'm bidding on it, because you, you don't know who you're bidding on, versus the silent auction where you keep writing your name. That, they said, if you want to avoid that, that's a little expensive to start for the organizations. But again, the organiz we'd have to approach the organizations. Are they willing? You don't know if they're all willing. I mean, if only three are willing, you know, maybe you get 50 people. Alderman Jacob? I guess my question wasn't really answered, going back to what Alderman Eugene Wesley said. So how, how much is the city putting in? Is the city putting $5,000 in or is the city putting $10,000 in? How much does the city actually put into this? All depends what you guys decide. I mean, we only allot so much money per year in the budget. So if that's what we're allotting, then that's all we're putting in. The organizations have to do the work. We are giving them staff time. That's, that's otherwise they wouldn't even need us. They could, you know, it's facilitated through the city through their staff time. Staff is sending out the invitations, you know, and whatnot. Alderman Wesley. Counting the money. My question to save a long debate on this, why don't we send a letter to all of the organizations that we have donated to already before we even sit here and say, yes, we am in favor with this and see if any of those organizations are even in favor of doing this? Because if these organizations aren't in favor, we're wasting our time. So I said, I'll make a motion on the floor that we send letters to all the uh, uh, organizations, see if they will participate or be interested in this. That will be my motion. I would second that motion. I think we'll go. Well, hold on, I've another question. question. Alderman Winger. In part, we do have to try and force their hand in participating because what would you pick would you pick free money that you're getting from the city just by asking or would you pick the oh i got to sell some tickets and go to a ball i i think 
I would pick the free money. So we, we have to force their hand a little bit to participate. Uh, and, and then secondly, uh, every um, things start with seed money. Look at Prairie Fest. We had Prairie Fest. It started out as a picnic about 10 years ago. We, the city paid for that picnic and the food. There was a free meal. And now we're, we're um, almost, or probably is self-sustaining. And there's donations, and it's rolling now. So we do have to put seed money in to get it started. And I see that as coming from the tourism fund. Maybe it's 10000 And it'll evolve over time, as the mayor is saying. And uh, that, that's how I envision it. Thank you. Alderman Woods, one last question. Two things. Um, one, I thought the question here was, did we actually want to do it and have staff invest any time? So really, we're kind of saying, go invest some time. I'm, I'm, I understand what you're saying, Alderman Wesley. But I thought the concept was, is the council in? Do they want to move forward with this idea or this concept? And, and we're kind of telling the, the staff to move ahead with it without saying we want to be in, which kind of is backwards. And, and the other comment that I wanted to put in is, is uh, the title or, or the name of, uh, of the, the mayor's community charity ball. Uh, maybe that should just be Wooddale Community Ball uh, as an alternative. I was thinking Art Woods Charity Ball, but. <laughs> I didn't think that would fly, but actually that was my idea. <laughs> yeah, there was a motion and a second. Roll call, please. What's the motion? Motion is some letters out to the organization who wants to participate in this before we come in. Okay. Roll call, please. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? No. Alderman Catalano? No. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. All those opposed. Oh, so I have a motion carries. So I have a uh, item for cons uh, considered for future meetings yeah. the se uh, senior citizen water rate voucher. You have August 22nd. I'm going to amend that to after the finalization of the water treatment plant. Bills are paid and what we owe. So I'll open end that date, not specifically August 22nd, please. Alderman Woods. What, what, maybe somebody can refresh my memory. The senior citizen water rate voucher is this a low income voucher? Is this a a qualification voucher or is this just across the board if you attain a certain age you get to pay less money I think there was a, a bunch of different scenarios talked about as far as discounts with water rates uh, seniors low income um, we were going to kind of develop that um, before the meeting on the 22nd I think Alderman Catalano was the one that originally brought that up so I'll, I'll defer to him it was uh, the report, the, uh, the actual uh, voucher was incorrect. I mean, it was going back to 2011, HUD limits, the income limit. So I wanted that change to 2013. Um, also, I wanted to increase the discount an extra $5. Instead of making it 15 make it 20 It's 10 isn't it? Isn't it 10 For the right seniors now? and the disabled. I thank you. No. No. Committee. There's no motion on the table. The adjournment. Uh, I'll move. I'll hold, Wait. hold it. Wait, Mike. Just uh, one future item. It's going to go to a council. I think I talked to a couple of you about it already. There's. Uh, you may remember when we passed the last treatment plant that ordinance that there was um, some discussion on. We'd have to go to the IPA, review the ordinance, and it may be, have to be passed again from time to time for, to update the ordinance. We're going to update the ordinance. The attorney talked with the IPA. They want to see some tweaks, some finer tune language within the ordinance. Won't affect our uh, procurement of the loan formality on the IEPA's end. So we're going to take that straight to council uh, next week. So that's why that's going to be on there. Motion by adjournment. So move. Second. Motion carries.
I'd like to call Public Health and Safety Judicial Committee to order. Let the record show that the same people are here. Need a motion approved in minutes. Uh, Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, number four, vehicle replacement purchase. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we're looking for approval to replace two squad cars that was in our current budget uh, for this year. Uh, total amount of $50,304 to Curry Motors for the purchase of two Ford, uh, Ford Interceptor utility vehicles, similar to the two that we purchased last year. Uh, this is a competitive bid through the Suburban Purchasing Cooperative. These vehicles aren't on state bid, but it does meet our bidding guidelines, and it's a competitively bid amongst all agencies. Okay. So move. Uh, that was my motion. Second. Aye. No, Aye. No, 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 no. It's money, so we got to go roll call. Oh. Sorry, people. Roll call. Now you follow the rules. <laughs> no. Oh, Ald <laughs> Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman E. Wesley? Yes. Okay, Chief. You got one more thing? I do. Uh, I would like to add on a future meeting, uh, electronic cigarette sales to minors. Uh, as of right now, there's no local ordinance against that. There's a pending state law, but I think uh, we should have the option, just like uh, with other laws, to have local ordinance uh, uh, enforcement, too. So that'll be for a future meeting. OK. Uh, you, go ahead. Chief, I'd just like to add to that. Could you look into, uh, I noticed uh, I was in a restaurant or restaurant slash bar and someone was smoking one of those electronic cigarettes. They had said they couldn't do it indoors. I don't know if there's a law against it or, I mean, obviously there's no nicotine or smoke, but. I can make that a part of the, uh, that report too. Thank you. When are you planning to bring this? How fast are you gonna do your work? Uh, possibly the end of July or uh, the, first, the first meeting in August. Uh, all I, all I want to make sure before I bring it forward is that uh, I want to take a closer look at what the pending state law is, and I don't think we necessarily have to wait for state action, but uh, so it may be coming later in July. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, I got a um, uh, motion to adjourn. A move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Bye bye. The uh, to order, uh, roll caller, or actually minute person, um, show that the same people are here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Report and recommendation on city-owned property maintenance. I'd like to turn that over to uh, Mr. Gallus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, there's really three things I want to try to accomplish with this item tonight. Uh, number one, I, I, I want to try to describe to you the current process uh, that Public Works follows on, its, uh, on our city property here. Uh, then I want to try to give you a couple options to think about to stimulate some conversation uh, and hope, hope to wrap up this item tonight uh, with some guidance uh, from you in terms of, you know, what we think we might be able to do here. Alderman uh, Roy Watson. Um, Mr. Chairman, we got our, this information in our packet already about the uh, city-owned property. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion already to go with option two of hiring an additional employee. Second. Any other further questions? Take your vote. Jeff? Just to clarify, is this... Uh, this budget year? Yes. Yeah, so presently? This would be uh, just to hire another person. So option, what are we talking about? Two. two. To option hire two. an additional streets employee. All in effective favor? Immediately. No. Aye. Aye. Money. Take a roll call. We have money? Where's yeah, you money? got to hire got to pay them. <laughs> okay. Roll call. Roll call? Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Szymarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. That passes. Uh, the Public Works Department is very grateful. Thank you all. Rich.
Wow, that was the easiest Fast thing. Report. Fast report. <laughs> Go to the next one right away. Really okay. It's all set to you. I, I um, don't know what that says about you, Rich, but. <laughs> report and recommendation, pay request, parcel number two for Schroeder Asphalt Services for Royal Oak Subdivision Improvement Project in the not to exceed amount of $239,833.08. That move. is my motion. Second. Roll call. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Susmarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman E. Yes. West. That passes. I should have Evelyn Woods speeding uh, read here. Number six, report and recommendation, pay request, partial number 14, Maxim Construction Corp for the North WWTP upgrade phase number 1A project in a not to exceed amount of $312,325.25. That is my motion. I'll second, second. The motion. Roll call, please. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Tismarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. That passes. And report and recommendation proposal for RG, RJN for the Sanitary Sewer Evaluation Survey project in the not to exceed amount of $139,730. That is my motion. Do I have a I second? will second that motion. Question? Eugene, I mean, uh, Pete? <laughs> Out of order. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question on this. Uh, there, there was a part in here that talked about uh, doing inspections on Saturday. So, and it said a city person and somebody from the RJN. So are we having, are we paying overtime for that day or? It's coming out long, Cody. Yeah. You're rich? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, you all know wasn't. And the reason why we do it on Saturday is because some people aren't home during the week and they're home on a weekend. So that's why we do the overtime. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Alderman Lazaro? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Tismarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Uh, Alderman passes. Eugene yes. Wesley? Oh. <laughs> this is as fast as I've ever had this move. Uh, items to be considered at future meetings. Uh, Emerald Ash Bohr. Rich, would you like to uh, input on that? Just had a couple words. Uh, April 22nd, we're, we're going to target up, I'm sorry, August 22nd. Still shell shocked by all, all this this evening. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to try to talk to you a little bit about a process, a program uh, to uh, make it a little bit more procedural than it is today. Uh, and get a plan together so we have a, a longer-term vision on Emerald Ashmore. Any other questions? No. Motion for adjournment. Make the second. motion second. Motion for adjournment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody else want to? Hey, Jeff. Get the